really, really appreciate the book and uh, your company. Thank you, Chris. It's great talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. We really appreciate it. Okay, later, Gators. Later. And good afternoon. You are listening to 94.1 FM KPFA here in Berkeley and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. It is 1 p.m. Stay tuned for Terra Verde. Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. That's right, you're listening to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. My name is Adam Greenfield. Hello, we'll be with you for the next 30 minutes. Okay, so let's take a situation. There's an old, old growth forest, prime real estate for logging. uh, And indeed, a company has decided to uh, have a go at it to log the forest. Permits have been filed. All the legal paperwork has been processed. Now, there's two broad avenues for people that might want to stop that. Uh, The first we all pretty much familiar with go through the legal system find a violation of a law go to court uh, file appeal that kind of thing but there's another approach and it's an approach that few of us would would take uh physically get in the way and stop the logging actually put your bodies on the road or or on the in the trees uh, people are doing this, of course. They've been doing it for decades. And there's even guides about how to do it. Well, today we're going to talk about one such guide. It's called the Earth First Direct Action Manual. Uh, what exactly does this book advocate? What's in it? And uh, do these things work? Well, to join us, uh, to help us discuss that today on Terra Verde, we've got two people who know this book pretty well, and they've seen it put into practice. Karen Pickett is a local activist She's been uh, an activist for over 30 years, involved with many projects, including the Berkeley-based Save the Oaks campaign and the Alliance for Sustainable Jobs in the Environment. We're also joined by Paniote from the Earth First Journal, a publication that carries news about the kinds of actions we'll be discussing today. Uh, Karen, welcome to Terra Verde. Thank you. And Paniote, welcome to Terra Verde as well. Hey, thanks. So, uh, Paniote, let's start with you. Um, the Earth First tagline, the uh, organization that has the uh, the journal you work for, uh, oh. no no compromise in defense of Mother Earth. Can you explain what that means? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's – well, I, I think that's one of the, the beauties of Earth First, that most of the concepts are pretty straightforward. So I think it it's as simple and clear as it sounds. But um, maybe there's some some need to explain the uh, extent of the no compromise ethic, because you know it's unfortunate to see that the position of no compromise, say taken, um, maybe if you work in an organization and you're like, you know, trying to agree on on something and someone pulls the no compromise card, that's not what we're talking about. Um, what we're talking about is specifically in regards to defending the earth from industrial. Uh, really industrial society in its entirety, that uh, Earth First is dedicated to challenging that at a fundamental level. And so we're not looking to negotiate, you know, we're not looking to stop a a coal plant to build a massive industrial, you know, solar or wind complex. Um, We're challenging that at its core level. So, you know, we uh, think we mean what we say, that we're not compromising and when we're talking about defending the planet. And maybe... uh, a comparison I've made before is that if someone's coming into your house, um, you know, and, and threatening you and your family, you don't start negotiating about whether or not you're going to, you know, trade off your uh, one of your siblings in exchange for being left alone or, you know, that's a, <clears throat> someone you maybe start swapping like you can take a, a couple limbs, just don't kill us. You know, when you're fighting for your life, you fight from the no compromise mindset. In my opinion, it kind of comes um, – a gut reaction, you know, comes like as a natural reflex. And we should have that reflex in relation to our uh, efforts to defend the earth. Okay, and so today we're talking about a manual that that outlines some 
uh, tactics and strategies for doing that, the Earth First Direct Action Manual. Peniote, can you just give us a little bit of background on this on this book? Yeah, the uh, the manual came out in um, the mid '90s, and it was, although not officially or formally from the Earth First Journal, um, many people who worked on the journal and you know had relationships with with printers and publishers. Um, and a lot of activists using some of these skills in the manual uh, put together the, the project and put it into print. So I wasn't on the Journal Collective at the time in, in the mid-'90s, but I'm um, familiar with some of the people who were. Mm-hmm. And it, um, had a second volume as well. And currently is, I think, in the process of trying to be um, re, you know, revamped with a third kind of belated volume. Okay, and and before we get into specifics, because because uh, it is available out there, kind of hard to find. But if you can, it's it's quite a an interesting read. But can you just give us a broad overview of what's in it? Sure. Yeah, like you said, it's it's been out of print, and it's really just kind of been put into sort of the underground press at this point. Um, but it's also available online. But it's, I think, a hard document to apply that way because, really, it's hands-on skills. It's the kind of thing that you put in a plastic bag and, you know, to keep it from getting wet uh, and bring it out into the forest with you and <clears throat> open it up. And, really, it's step-by-step on how to build road blockades, how to uh, occupy space for longer, not just in the backwoods but also in the cities, in office buildings, um, different techniques to, you know, extend your occupations, or um, you know, hold down your your road blockades so they're as effective as possible in bringing attention and uh, slowing down the you know the process or the uh, whatever it is the extraction industry or logging like you mentioned. So it's it's the basic skills for pulling those things off. Okay, uh, let's get into some to some specifics now. Could you pick out a few examples of things that are talked about in the book and kind of uh, take us through it a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, some of my favorites in there are, um, you know, some of the, the simplest, like building tripods, um, which I think essentially is like something that kids would probably probably learn in like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or basic kind of camping 101. <clears throat> but magnifying that and um, creating a structure that one person could climb in and um, could sit in and basically require a cherry picker or a fire truck or some sort of heavy equipment in order to get them down. So what would be one person, you know, standing in front of a truck that would take within a matter of seconds to drag off the road, this structure becomes a blockade that tends to last a couple, usually a couple hours, you know, from one to five hours, depending on how far, how far out you are maybe. But, uh, like in some instances in, in the cities and reclaim the streets where one tripod has been surrounded by hundreds or thousands of people. They, that's, that blockade has been the primary way that they sh- shut down entire financial districts. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also techniques like how to build um, what we call lock boxes. Um, you, people have probably seen them by this point where there's essentially it's like a, a glorified, you know, sit-in where your your arms are connected with a a low tech but effective device of some sort of you know metal or or plastic even that makes it harder to drag you apart so instead of just linking arms at the protest with the person next to you you're actually attached and it requires again heavy machinery to get you apart so it takes a lot longer there's something in the book that i noticed called a sleeping dragon which seemed very interesting do, do, have you ever seen that do you know what that is Sure. That's kind of funny because that, that, today law enforcement uses that phrase to refer to a whole, you know, slew of things. But in the direct action manual, a sleeping dragon is referring to a specific tactic of using a lockbox or some sort of device that you plan on unveiling at a later date. And so you you might want to you put it in the ground and... Um, Warner Creek is a great example of this in, in 1996. Um, they had lock boxes in the ground, and when, and when logging was approved, um, they didn't have to go and, you know, dig holes on that night. 
they were prepared, and the, the sleeping dragons only needed to be occupied, which took a matter of seconds, and that ended up lasting 11 months in order to, you know, to finally evict it, and ultimately that sale was was saved. So the sleeping dragon in that situation, you know, became an entire free state in a series of blockades, and um, so the sleeping dragon is a, is like a, you know, a couple of different techniques combined into a uh, specific scenario. Okay. Well, Karen, uh, have you seen have you seen these the the tactics or techniques in this book applied? And can you tell us about some noteworthy occasions that that you you know of? Yeah, I <laughs> I've seen a lot of these um, techniques and tactics applied, and I and I think that you know one thing that it's worth noting. Um, and that's actually related to one of the things that you said at the beginning of the interview that, you know, some people um, choose to go down one route, which is challenging things on a legal basis, and other people choose to go the direct action route. I think that in, in a lot of campaigns and, and in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily either or, but it's, you know, the, the points in time and... Um, and and the you know it depends on what it is you're opposing and who else you have as your allies when you're choosing your tactics and strategies because it's it's always about being effective and oftentimes direct action is applied after people have carried out um other kinds of campaign strategies um, through, you know, legal routes or whatever, and then this is kind of the last ditch effort to finally stop them. And and there's also been over the the course of the the history of Earth First using direct action, and and Earth First used to be distinguished by direct action, by its use of direct action, besides being a biocentric organization. And now I think that it's still distinguished by being a biocentric organization, but a lot of groups use direct action. And it's interesting to look at the evolution of not only direct action strategies, but the evolution of direct action technology over the years, because um, the first blockade that I did in 1983 in the Bald Mountain Road in a wilderness area in Oregon, we really did without any technology at all, and it was because blockades were not being employed in forest campaigns, and so we could hike many miles into the forest and... Um, and do a blockade on a road that was being built, and we really were able to take them by surprise. And so we essentially shut down the job for the entire day. And now police have their own tactics and strategies that they can pull out of their back pocket to deal with blockaders or tree sitters or whatever it is. And so we've had to evolve our technology so that we can still achieve basically the same results and it's a pretty creative process you know whether it's people putting their arms in these metal pipes so that they are attached either to a machine or to each other um, or or climbing high up in a tree with with two weeks worth of provisions or climbing a bridge and holding a and hanging a banner um, and it's you know, really what what the appropriate technology for a particular situation is, is what's going to be most effective. Can you, uh, you, you talk about the evolution of uh, blockade tactics in, in kind of parallel with evolution of authorities tactics to, you know, deal with those. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about that evolution? Well, I think that... Um, the the lock boxes, the pipes that we use are a good example and it's it's not just the evolution in time, it's also, you know, where you're carrying out your campaign because in some areas I guess Northern California would be a good example because we've had forest campaigns that employ direct action in Northern California since the early eighties and uh law enforcement up there are are pretty used to what activists are going to do when they go out into the into the woods. So I think that there's some strategies that 
for whatever reason, don't seem to get old <laughs> like tree sitting. Um, and so people can still do that effectively. But, you know, whereas people used to just link arms and, and, and you know, in some, in some cases, police would be afraid of um, hurting the protesters if they tried to pull them apart. I think that, that the police are less afraid of that now, it would seem. Um, so people have to use these pipes and other ways that, that, you know, make them immovable. But sometimes you're, you're in areas, not so much the urban areas, but you know, maybe the campaigns that have happened in the Midwest or, you know, Minnesota, where there's not direct action going on all the time. And so you can use strategies that the police haven't seen before, um, and they can be just as effective. Mm -hmm. Well, you're listening to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley or KCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. I'm Adam Greenfield. Today, Paniote from Earth First Journal and local grassroots activist Karen Pickett join us to discuss people who attempt to physically stop environmental destruction. And we're talking about one guide in particular they use to do it, the Earth First Direct Action Manual. Um, Karen, can you tell me about the, the physical and the emotional experience of engaging these in these kind of actions? So, you know, most people listening would never have... Uh, have never done these kind of things. Can you tell us about the the what it feels like to be involved with that? Well, and and I think that there's you know there's a lot of assumptions that that really don't hold true because people might think that you know putting yourself on the line so to speak um, like that is a is a brave thing to do or a scary thing to do, and um, it can be certainly, but for the most part. In my personal experience, I haven't found it that way. I've found um, engaging in direct action to be incredibly empowering, and it's it's actually what got me involved in Earth First in the first place. Was um, you know I was just kind of getting my dipping my toes in the, in the water, as it were, with my first blockade um, up in Oregon because I was really intrigued by what people were doing and and mostly because it was such a hands-on approach and I'd been involved mostly in recycling and I did um, my first blockade up there and you know it was it sounds kind of corny but it, I really had an epiphany because I I watched this bulldozer shut down turn off the motor lower the blade and the you know the guy climb out of the seat cursing at us and we stopped working for that day on this road that never should have been built and we won that campaign so you know there were there were six of us <laughs> and we had no technology so it's it can be an incredibly empowering experience it's also a way to um, turn small numbers of people into something that's much more powerful if you don't have the large numbers and and you can employ uh, you know other kinds of strategies when you do have the large, large numbers and take advantage of those numbers. But I think, you know, it's a way to achieve that same level of, of effectiveness. Paniote, can you tell us uh, about your, your reflections? Sure. I mean, I think I share most of the sentiments that, that Karen's been speaking of, but I also, you know, I uh, dabble a bit um, in various forms of, of organizing, I think as a lot of us do, but I've also um, been a part of filing, you know, administrative um, sort of challenges, legal challenges, or citizens' petitions, and um, in organizing those and seeing how they work together with direct actions and blockades, I've come to, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the um, the next direct action manual has a little bit more about some of that. You know, that um, I agree entirely that. You know, participating in direct action can be really empowering and effective, and a small number of people can accomplish, you know, amazing things. And I've seen it above and beyond what these, like, huge, big green organizations pull off. We do out of our pockets, you know, on a shoestring. But I think that it's also important to acknowledge what we uh, often call paper wrenching or 
you know, the administrative process that helps oftentimes create the formula that leads to an um, environmental victory. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if you have a more specific question, but just in listening to, to Karen's response, that's what I would want to add is that people see that's not necessarily that direct action is, like, distinct from other organizing, but that, you know, the, the broader and more diverse our tactics are, the generally the more effective we tend to be. It's interesting you raised that point, and, and you both have raised that point about the need to uh, combine the different strategies, you know, direct action with, you know, other, you, called, you, you referred to it as paper wrenching. Uh, do you think that, do you see a lot of imbalance in uh, tactics used by various environmental groups? Do you, do you find often they're sort of perhaps using too much of this or too much of that? Sure. I think maybe most specifically I would want to speak to that as, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I tend to on occasionally, uh, you know, on occasion come out to other meetings like our local Sierra Club group. Um, who tends to also support actions and protests that our local, our group here I'm involved with in the Everglades is, is organizing. And when I've asked them about their willingness to participate in civil disobedience, they've pointed to the organization um, that as a whole, as a national club, their organization has a policy against it, um, uh, you know, not allowing people to use civil disobedience as um, under the name of Sierra Club, and I would think something that you know that would be beneficial to a broader and more effective movement would be groups willing. You know, if our Earth First group is willing to file administrative challenges and um, you know petitions, it would be great if groups like Sierra Club, I think, also took a step in the direction of participating or accepting um, you know their membership using civil disobedience as an effective strategy, which we know it can be. And so that, that to me that's just kind of one example, but I think there's a lot of others that are also in there with different organizations who could maybe build the bridges between, um, you know, effective strategies and tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen, you referred before to some of the direct action uh, that you've seen as delaying uh, work happening for a couple of hours. It, it sounds like if, if, if you were to blockade and, and stop work for a couple of hours, wouldn't it, doesn't that just delay it by a couple of hours? How, do, do, you, do, you, do you see these actions actually being successful and permanently stopping things happening? Well, they can be. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, but I think that the, um, you know, I, I think as Peniote said, that, that any sorts of um, tactics and strategies are are most effective when they're um, when they're part of a whole campaign where where you're looking at what needs to be done um, right this moment. And a lot of times the delaying tactics have an, an economic fallout. And you know if you keep at it, then then something becomes not really worth doing because you know a lot of the things that we're fighting like logging on public lands and national forests to use one example are are, are only marginally uh, economically viable and so you can kind of tip the balance by making something more expensive and and it's also the the point in time you know when uh, the campaign that I'm involved with right now trying to stop Caltrans from widening the highway through Richardson Grove, the ancient redwoods in Richardson Grove State Park in Northern California. Um, we haven't used direct action in that campaign yet because we're kind of in the legal arena and another one of our colleague organizations filed a, a lawsuit, actually two lawsuits, and those are working their way through the courts and we've gone and had rallies at the State House and at Caltrans headquarters in Sacramento and so far we've been able to stop them from breaking ground on this project that they intended to start um, 
you know, they, they intended to have shovels in the ground probably at least two years ago. And at some point in time, they might decide that it's, it's just not worthwhile because they have a lot of other projects. If they don't and we lose in court, then we're out blocking the roads and and we're out there carrying out our direct action so you know it's it's really choosing that point in time and i before we run out of time too i just want to mention that because i mentioned that campaign we have an event coming up at ashkenaz that is a benefit for the richardson grove campaign and in fact we'll have copies of the direct action manual um and the earth first journal uh at our table there it's it's on Friday, April 6th at um, Ashkenaz here in Berkeley, and it's called the Stomp the Stumps Benefit Dance Party, and it's a benefit for my organization, Bay Area Coalition for Headwaters and Earth First. Okay, Karen, well, you preempted my invitation, so congratulations. <laughs> I'll, I'll hand the show over to you next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had one more question for you, actually, uh, Karen, before we... Uh, we close it out and Paniotti gets to speak as well. Um, the, the direct action manual uh, has a whole section on nonviolence and it, it, it really puts a big point on that. Can, can you explain to us why uh, nonviolence is such an important part of this, in your opinion? I think, you know, if, if you asked 10 people that question, you'd get 10 different answers. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's really important when people are getting into um, carrying out direct action campaigns to study the power of nonviolence, regardless of, of how their, their campaign plays out, because it's something that can be very powerful and, and you can use nonviolence in, in, in a keto kind of way and disempower your opponent. And oftentimes when people employ violence, you know, violence begets violence. So I, I think that it's, um, it's something that, that is used with strategic effectiveness to, um, to get to a more powerful place when facing down your opponents. But it's also something that makes a very powerful statement and is, I think, one of the things that can make people observing direct action campaigns okay. feel really inspired by what they're seeing. All right. Well, thanks, Karen. We're almost out of time. Uh, uh, Paniote, do you, um, can, uh, how can people find out more about your work before we uh, close out the show? Yeah, it would be great. <laughs> If folks want to check out the Earth First Journal, we, uh, you can subscribe to the magazine online or follow our newswire, um, which we publish daily updates on the Internet. But, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, publications left in print like this. So I think if people – and it's really – we don't have a main organizational kind of bureaucracy. This is our networking tool. So I would say get in touch with the Earth First Journal, um, subscribe, and, and um, you know, spread the word about it. And we can be in touch that way. You can find us at earthfirstjournal.org or call the office anytime. If I can give a number, it's 561-249-2071. We can probably scrape together a copy of the uh, direct action manual for you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, thanks, Paniote and Karen. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, can I also mention that we have a free showing at Occupy Oakland this Monday of the just-released Judy Berry documentary. Okay, wonderful. Right. Well, we, we are literally out of time, so that's all we've got. Uh, Terra Verde is going to be back next week. This show and others are available for download at stream at kpfa.org. I'm Adam Greenfield. Have a great weekend. Listening to Terra Verde and KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Join us again over lunch between 1 and 2 in the afternoon on Fridays to hear more about the unfolding future of the planet. Peter Beinart, former editor of The New Republic, senior political writer for The Daily Beast, editor in chief of Zion Square. 
believes today's Jews are failing at their most important challenges. He insists the relationship between American Jews and Israel must change. In his provocative new book, The Crisis of Zionism, he calls for American Jews to defend the dream of a democratic Jewish state before it is too late. Peter Beinart will appear on Tuesday evening, April 17th, 